Before we get started, I'm going to show you a little video about my company. If you want an airplane and that airplane is going to come in and out of the state of California, there's a lot of things that you need to know. First of all, you need to know me. First of all, you need to know me. I run the largest company that that goes through these processes with people and helps them legally avoid paying the tax to the state of California. Often I refer to the state of California as the Socialist Republic of California with a K. Some people think that's funny. The state of California doesn't think it's funny. I don't care. I don't really care. There's a reason why I wrote my book called The Equality Police, which is available on Amazon, and you should read it. You should get to know all of this, but back to today's subject, okay? If you have an airplane and it flies in and out of California, California has a process where they have their property tax people, which are actually county people, go around and make unannounced visits to airports and they write down all the tail numbers. So they are going to catch you eventually. Don't rely on subterfuge, okay? Do not. If you have an airplane that is on flight aware, state of California has access to all that. They know where you took off from, they know how long you were in the air, and they know where you landed, okay? Google yourself on some time and find out how much information about your use and where you're at and where your airplane is. It's all there for them. Okay, so be aware that there is some danger associated with purchasing an aircraft that you're going to use coming in and out of California. And here's what I'm going to offer you for free. Before you make that purchase, call me. I w it's a free call. I'm going to ask you a set of questions and I'll get an idea of what you're trying to do and I'll tell you what you have to look out for. And that's all free, right up to the point that I discover that you're really in danger and I'm going to tell you what the danger is and I'm going to tell you what my fee is to make sure that you don't have any danger. I've done over 1,500 of these cases. As long as you hire me before you take possession and as long as you follow all of my instructions during the test period, depending upon what test period we use, you're not going to pay the tax. Why do I know that? Because none of my 1,500 previous clients have ever paid the tax. Follow my instructions. Do what I tell you to do. That's why I am who I am. Okay? This is Tom Alston from Aero Marine Tax Professionals. 916-691-9192. Find out why people say, call Tom. Well, here we are. Good morning, Brian. Good morning, Tom. Can you hear me okay? That's what I, well, I was checking. I was making sure you turned on your audio, and I'm going to turn the stage over to you and make sure that you introduce yourself to our, our guests and get started. Great. Thank you very much. Well, good morning. Thank you, Tom. Thank you for the opportunity to, to speak with you and your clients, and um, hopefully this information session will be valuable. Um, what we're going to talk about today is ethics in transactions. Uh, my name is Brian Proctor. I'm the chairman, current acting chairman of the International Aircraft Dealers Association, formerly known as NARA, which was the National Aircraft Resale Association. About two weeks ago, we changed the name of the organization, uh, which reflects our international presence. Uh, NARA uh, currently comp is composed of 38 broker-dealer members and 55 product and service members. The 38 broker-dealers represent 3% of, of all of the broker-dealers in the world. However, we're responsible for more than 60% of the pre-owned transactions globally. So uh, it's a little organization, but uh, we have a big impact in the industry. And we're, we're working on a lot of things right now that will, um, we hope, change the way that aircraft are bought and sold around the world. Um, well, today we're going to talk about ethics. And, and when NARA was founded 27 years ago, core to the beliefs of the initial 10 founders was an ethics statement. And, and so since then, we have we've basically hung our hat on this concept of ethics and transactions. Prior to the, this presentation, I did a little research just to see what uh, Webster's Dictionary would say about ethics. And, and really, it's basically this idea of dealing with what's good and bad or with moral duty or obligation. Interestingly, around the world, moral duty and moral obligations change. And so if you look further down in the definition that, that Webster has presented, um, it, it talks about the principles of conduct, 
kind of governing an individual or group. And that's where we, uh, as NARA, step forward with, or I IATA, with this idea of ethics in the statement. Um, the code of ethics that we created, again, this is uh, originally developed 27 years ago. It's been modified since then. But the idea is basically maintaining a reputation of honesty, integrity, and transparency in all parts of transactions. And the goal for our members is, is we absolutely want each member to do that in terms of, of, of the way that they buy and sell aircraft. Um, earlier this year, MBAA published a new guide for ethics for the industry that covers all transactions, not just aircraft transactions. And so they're talking about not only the buying and selling of airplanes, but also um, the usage of, of um, uh, FBOs, MROs, and how all of these transactions are impacted. And, and NARA was very, very quick to come in and support that, that statement that MBAA came out with. And the idea is that the entire industry, um, you know, we, we serve a very unique clientele. And um, at times, our industry has been in the spotlight uh, nationally and internationally. And the goal for the industry from top to bottom, operators, owners, brokers, manufacturers, maintenance facilities, FBOs, is that we have an industry that operates at the highest level of ethics possible. Um, today, we're facing a lot of different issues um, within aviation. And, and specifically, when you talk about the, the transactions process, most owners, when they start into the process, uh, they, they usually are thinking about buying pre-owned aircraft first. Very seldomly do first-time buyers buy new, but uh, oftentimes they're, they're talking with a pre-owned broker. Most customers assume that in the brokerage world, there's oversight. And whether it's accreditation, licensing, um, certification, there's this assumption that there's oversight in the industry. And I always tell the joke, um, for those of you who are on uh, the VTC, you can see that um, I'm uh, challenged with, uh, with the amount of hair on my head. In the state of Texas, in order to get a license to, to cut hair, to be a barber, it requires 1,500 hours of training in order to get the license to do that. In order to buy or sell an airplane, it requires absolutely zero. And so... Um, what we've done is, uh, as IATA is to create a system, and we're in the process of implementing that that I'll talk about later, that creates a, a accreditation program for the dealers and then a certification program for the brokers underneath it. Right now, in the marketplace, there are over 500 brokers. Um, there are no standards, and oftentimes, and I'm sure, Tom, you see this with your clients, it sometimes creates havoc in transactions. And because there's no standardization, there's, and the fact that we've got a fragment in the industry, there's a, a tremendous amount of fee pressure that's going on right now. And in some cases, that's one driver, not all the drivers, but one driver for the unethical behavior that we're seeing. I mentioned earlier that MBAA uh, published their, their statement on ethics earlier this year. NATA, EBAA, and IBAC have all addressed this, and they're looking at ethics as, as something that's important for their organizations as well. Um, there's been press releases recently about ethics issues. Um, I received a call about two weeks ago from a, a client who signed a lease on a G4SP. The airplane never showed up. Unfortunately, the, the, the person who had signed the lease had funded $630,000 to a broker um, in order to affect the lease. And now he's in the process of litigating that issue, and you know, hopefully he'll, he'll get recovery. But... The point is, is that, that those types of activities just shouldn't happen in our space. And in our role at IADA, we've had numerous requests from banks, from attorneys, from the OEMs, MROs to address the issues of ethics. And so we're focusing on that. So what does that mean for the, uh, for the industry? And, and what are examples of ethics issues? Um, right now, with to become a member at IATA, um, it's, a, it's a pretty exhaustive process. This is going to actually become more complex over the coming months. But the general rules are that you have to have been in business for five years as a company. You have to have demonstrated uh, either being the acquiring or selling broker for at least 10 transactions per year. You have to pass a rigor, rigorous application process, be sponsored by three current members, pass an 80% majority vote for the dealership combined, adhere to the IATA Code of Ethics, participate in ongoing uh, education programs, and con conduct themselves honorably. So 
it's a fairly tall order. Uh, we anticipate that in the next five months we'll be rolling out a new accreditation process for dealers to apply for membership. Um, in the process of doing that, we've actually put that the, the application process on hold until uh, starting in December, we're going to start taking the applicants. But the point of this is that um, we're trying to set a high bar in terms of the people who are actually in the companies that are out there representing buyers and sellers of aircraft. And we get a little bit of background on, on what's going on here. If you look at uh, from April 1st of 2017 to March 31st of 2018, we've got 12 months of transaction data provided to us uh, by JetNet. During that period of time, 1,962 jets sold with a broker, 495 brokers. And of that, basically 112 did more than five transactions. There are only 50 brokers firms that did more than 10. The point of that is, is that roughly 90% of all brokers don't meet the IATA standards. And what's more interesting is that one third of all deals are done by brokers who are doing less than four. And so Tom, think about it. In your opening statement, you said you had done 1,500 uh, you have 1,500 clients who've, who've gone through the process of, of uh, doing tax calculations for the state of California. Imagine if you only did that four times a year. How good would your practice be? And so, um, you know, within the organization, you know, we're, we're working really hard to try to raise the standards uh, for all the groups that are involved. I want to talk next about some of the things that we've seen at IATA and some of the implications in the marketplace. Uh, the first is a case study that happened in 2016. There was a Gulfstream G550 disposition. The buyer um, was unwilling to hire a, a buyer's agent to assist them in buying the airplane. Found out through the process of talking to the people involved that the buyer was willing to buy the airplane at $24.3 million. The seller, interestingly, was willing to sell the airplane at $24 million. There was a broker in the middle that wanted to back-to-back -to -back the transaction at $24.6 they tied up the airplane from the seller. Um, it was tied up for 45 days while they were working through uh, the, the process of preliminary inspections, visuals, uh, and the transactions. And during that time, the aircraft lost $1.25 million of value, according to Blue Book. Um, and that period of time was, a, was an unprecedented time and, and value de uh, declination. But the point is that this owner got negatively affected by over a million dollars because of people behaving ineffect ineffectively in the marketplace. Um, the airplane ultimately sold for 22.75. The goal of this is, you know, not necessarily do we always have to have brokers involved, but we want to make sure that back-to-backs that are conducted are conducted for reasonable purposes, and I'll talk about that in a second. The second case that we want to talk about is a, a case that just recently came to our attention. There was a super mid-sized aircraft that was set up for disposition. The seller hired a broker on the recommendation of the chief pilot. The fee for the transaction was $125,000 uh, or 0.78% of the asset value. If you think about real estate with normal fees in the 6 to 7% range, this is incredibly low. In this case, we talk about bad behavior, the pilot wanted a $100,000 kickback for the broker to get the listing. The aircraft was listed at 16.9. It was valued, the, the airplane should have traded at about $16 million. And the seller wanted $16 million for the, for the sale of the airplane. The broker attempted for four months to find a buyer above $16 million and, and capture the spread. And what ended up happening is the, the airplane, according to Blue Book, lost more than $1 million of value during those four months of, of holding period. Again, this is a negative impact to the owner. It's a negative impact to the market. It's a negative impact to everyone involved in the transaction. Um, Sometimes, uh, you know, there's a, in the current market, there's a, or current conversations, there's a negative connotation to back-to-backs. Um, I do want to present one case where there, there are back-to-backs and they do have a, a, a real reason for existing. In 2012, uh, there was an Abu Dhabi-based owner who had an ultra-long-range aircraft with only 350 hours. The airplane was Greek-registered and Swiss-managed. The owner didn't want to list the airplane but was willing to sell the aircraft to a broker for $31 million with, an ex with a 60-day exclusive right to purchase. The broker found a Chinese buyer at $31.9. The broker put up a half-million-dollar deposit, and the buyer put up a million-dollar deposit. The broker paid for the pre-buy, the export, the dereg, the import, the registration, and certain movement costs. Um, and both sides were mirrored, and, and as part of the transaction, all parties knew that the broker had this, this responsibility to buy-sell. Um, so in this case, this is a classic example of a back-to-back -back that should exist. 
you know, maybe as an industry, we need to change the names of these types of, of transactions. Maybe call it a dealer transaction. Maybe call it a buy sell transaction. But you know, not all back to backs are inappropriate. And if, if we go back to the previous case study, in this case, the the broker was trying to create a spread and do a back to back and make the spread because he um, felt an obligation, unwarranted obviously, to pay the um, the pilot. In this case, you have an example of where one was done, and it makes total sense. Um, the, the point of all of these trans the case studies, though, is that there are certain transactions that create inefficiency in the marketplace. And typically what we find is that this inefficiency creates a uh, um, lost opportunity for everyone involved. It creates lost opportunities for attorneys, for MRO, for brokers, for the owners, for the buyers. And so... Um, the goal is to try to create more market efficiency because we feel like that this will help the entire marketplace. So um, with IATA, we, we've stepped forward and we created a strategic plan to try to do that. And really it's focused on kind of four key initiatives. The first is to raise awareness and the profile of the profession through advocacy, marketing, and PR. The second goal, and this is really important in this, in this process, is to seek standardization where possible. Uh, we're currently working on a standardized LOI. We'll more than likely present that at the, uh, the NBAA conference next month. Um, and the, the idea there is to have a, 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 a level start point for all transactions. Um, we're working hard on an accreditation program. We've engaged with a, a consulting firm that's going to help us create both an, an accreditation program for the dealers and then a certification program at the individual broker level. Our, uh, the third goal is to resource our member firms better, to reduce the cost of, of operating and, and create a competitive advantage, and then increase involve, create a, um, more involvement in the organization through committees and through uh, just depth of leadership within our, our part of the industry. Um, the strategy of the, of the organization is, you know, our purpose is to have all of our members be more profitable, more successful. And as a vision, what we've, as the board, we've developed this idea that we want to be the acknowledged leader in developing standards for the industry. And the idea is to create market efficiency for buyers and sellers. And we think that, that with what we're doing, we're definitely going to create um, a, a more efficient marketplace, and it's going to help these transactions occur quicker and easier for everyone involved. The other thing that we're going to work on is pr providing a, a place where standards and ethics and exchange of information between the members and the public is is going to be um, uh, not required, but uh, the idea of encouraged so that we can have a, a more transparent market, which we think will also increase efficiency in the marketplace. When you look at IATA and, and who we are and what we do, we serve basically our members. I mean, the organization doesn't exist other than to make the members more profitable and more successful. But it's important for us to always remember that our members serve the owners of aircraft, buyers and sellers. And at the end of the day, everyone in this industry, whether you are a maintainer, a pilot, an MRO, an OEM, an attorney, a broker, we all stand on the shoulders of the people who are entrusting us with confidence to help them own these aircraft and operate them in as efficient way as possible. For owners, when you're looking at the transactions process, what does success look like? More efficiency in the marketplace? smoother transactions and less unethical behavior. And the goal is to have an enjoyable private aviation experience. And it, you know, regardless of who you talk to, you know, I've had interviews with over a thousand different aircraft owners and operators during my career. And in the process of doing that, people want what the aircraft provides them, which is the ability to move from place to place safely and confidently and to make their lives and their businesses easier and more profitable. And at some cases in our industry, we've made the process more complicated. And unfortunately, we've lost people as a part of that. So uh, how do we get to where we want to go as an organization? Through really three focus areas, standardization, accreditation, and data integrity. What does this look like? So for standardization, we're starting first with LOIs. We are working later on on agreements. Um, we've got a committee right now set up with MRO facilities to help um, determine what's the best way and most efficient way to have pre-buy reports developed and output to the buyer and seller as part of the transaction. What happens in a lot of cases is that you have 
poorly written agreements and the MRO facility ends up being the arbiter of the pre-buy inspection as opposed to be just being basically the, the company that conducts the assessment of the aircraft. And in an MRO world, I know, I know one MRO facility recently that had an airplane stuck for more than 10 days occupying floor space because the buyer and seller couldn't agree on what was uh, the delivery condition of the aircraft and because of a poorly written agreement. The OEMs are seeking standardization, and then at the end of the day, what we hope to have is standardized brokerage agreements so that a buyer or a seller, whether they're working with us or Avpro or Jetcraft or any of the other major uh, brokers out there, um, have a similar set of, of um, terms and conditions that they're looking at when they compare the different firms. Accreditation is the next area that we're really focusing on. This is going to be, in my opinion, the long pole in the tent. The accreditation process for the companies will be fairly straightforward and we'll have that, the, the accreditation process um, and requirements defined before the end of the year. Um, and the goal will look something like, well, we're focused on the tenure of the company, the experience of the, of the principles that are involved, the minimum requirements in terms of insurance, the number of deals, uh, following the ethics statement, compliance with FCPA training, um, things like that. And so we're really focusing on um, on areas where there are measurable and specific requirements to become an accredited member of the organization. At the individual level, we're working on certification, which means training, testing, and that will include things like tenure and the number of deals and the dollar amount, and then having some sort of oversight from the the uh, dealer who's the member of IATA, and then obviously an agreement with the ethics statement. The point of both of these is that if we work at the dealer level and at the broker level, we're going to create a higher standard. And and what we hope is by the end of next year that the uh, that we have the certification program in place and we have the accreditation program in place, and we look like we're well on, on track to get that done. The third area that we're focusing on is data integrity. And people ask me all the time, what does this look like? And really, it's, it's the concept of making sure that our, our the dealers and brokers represent aircraft appropriately. And so if you think about the, the real estate world, you've got Realtor.com and you've got Zillow, you've got several other sites. At this point, IATA doesn't have the equivalent of a Realtor.com. Um, that's changing. In January, we're going to roll out a new platform. And we're really excited about it because we feel like that it's going to be a, a, a good location for buyers and sellers to meet. Um, the name of that uh, website is going to be called aircraftexchange.com. Uh, the other thing that we really want to focus on is aircraft valuation. Um, there are a lot of firms right now that present value what aircraft values as part of a transaction. Um, oftentimes, these values have, have been misrepresented. Um, and then sometimes when the aircraft are, are presented or the values are presented, it, it may not tell the whole story. And so, for example, if there were 10 G550 transactions and nine of the 10 traded at $20 million, but one traded at 15, a buyer might say, well, if one traded at 15, I want to buy an airplane at $15 million. And unless that buyer is educated and understands that, no, you don't really get it. The airplane wasn't on an engine program. It um, you know, the airplane was painted pink and purple and oh by the way it slid off a runway three years ago it, those, those actually impact the value and the, the, the concept might be that the airplane really traded at an index rate of 22 million but people get fixated on the actual sales price and don't understand what was actually involved in the transaction so as a, as a goal of what we're focusing on as an organization is really having transparent transparency with regard to sales prices and, and a lot of data sharing among the IATA members. I think this will help everybody who's a member. Who benefits from these, these, uh, these, these goals? Um, when you think about uh, standardization, buyers and sellers benefit, the industry benefits, and dealers benefit. But specifically, buyers and sellers will have simpler transactions quicker process getting through the deal, less risk during pre-buy, and fewer back-to-backs. The industry will have a more efficient market, and the dealers will have, again, simpler transactions, quicker transactions, and less risk and more clarity during the whole process. From a, an accreditation standpoint, everybody benefits. Um, and it really the idea is, is known standards 
and the and confidence and knowing that the person that if, if you're a buyer or seller the person that you hire has been through a process that it gives a certain level of accreditation or certification for their standards the industry is going to benefit and the dealers will benefit as well from a in data integrity standpoint it's um, it's it's fairly straightforward and more transparency is going to absolutely make a, a big impact into the industry I think that buyers and sellers will be able to decide quicker you know right now with the number of, of pre-owned airplanes drastically reducing on a daily basis because buying activity is so high uh, that there's not a lot of data that's available for airplanes that are in the process of closing and this year our firm has done over 300 appraisals if you think about that that's a lot of transactions and um, that what we're seeing is that the pre-owned market is compressing and so you know what are aircraft really valued at and the goal would be to have a, a real-time tool for IATA members to be able to define what those prices are um, on a on a day to day by day basis, and again, from a transparency standpoint, it helps it helps everybody. As an organization, we're focused on on um, having the having aircraft exchange up and live by January first. The standardized LOI will be presented this year at NBAA at the base conference. The purchase and sale agreement we're going to work on next year, but that's going to take a less of a priority other than dealing with. Um, accreditation programs which will be in place by January and then the certification program which is going to be our key focus for 2019 the goal with that is to make sure that by the end of next year we have um, the, the, the standards in place so that the industry can uh, sleep a little bit better at night and not have to deal with uh, some of the actions that we've seen in the past um, so Tom, I'm basically done with the presentation and wanted to open up the floor for questions if there are any out there well as i said in the beginning i really encourage everyone who's uh on this uh attending this webinar to ask questions because you get a chance to ask the guy who's even though he refuses the crown uh, the guy who's kind of got his finger on everything that's going on with the iada and any case studies or any things that happened to you that maybe you think that Brian meet needs to be made aware of here's your opportunity to do so uh, we've all heard horror stories you don't have to be in this industry very long to hear horror stories un unfortunately and <clears throat> everybody's got an opinion so on, on that standard we're all kind of sitting in an equal spot but here we are in a forum where it's an opportunity for you to discuss with multiple people the <clears throat> your particular situation and how you would like to see this resolved yeah. I and, for one my go ahead yeah and Tom to add to that um, this year at the NBAA base conference um, I'll be speaking with the um, on a panel as part of one of the presentations with folks from NBAA NATA um, and one other organization and so I think we're gonna have a fairly broad discussion of, of of ethics issues across the industry and so look forward to to um, people's feedback and, and attendance at that meeting too because I think that's that's going to be a, a really interesting conversation is this is your organization the International Aircraft Dealers Association going to have a physical presence like a booth at the NBAA show we won't have a booth this year, but we will have um, a very, very large tent and display action. In, in fact, IATA will have the largest physical footprint of any presenter at the static display. So we're going to have 24 airplanes on display. Uh, we're going to be serving lunch for anybody who wants to participate on uh, Tuesday and Wednesday. So it's free. Just you know, join us. And so when you walk into the static, if you take a hard left, we're going to be right there, and you'll see the IATA logos. And um, you know, the, the airplanes will be ranging from you know turbo props through G550s, and so it's going to be a very, very large uh, display. And you know, we're we're proud to be partners with MBAA in this because it's it's a big commitment for our organization, but it's also we hope that it benefits all of our members. Well, I, it looks like you've answered everybody's question. Wait a minute. 
Shea says she's waving at me. There's a question that looks like it's coming through. What difficulties are you expecting in your process of standardization on an international level, dealing with non-U.S. dealers, brokers, buyers, and sellers, in other words? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And, and fundamentally, that is um, the, the, the largest discussion element that we had within, um, within the, the NARA board as we were talking about the idea of um, changing the name to IATA. And because in the reality is, is that, you know, moral standards change from region to region around the world due to a lot of different things I'm not going to go into. Um, but one of the things that, that really has sort of helped us, in fact, is the banking industry. And um, around the world, banks have similar standards in terms of what's ethical and unethical with regard to how they, they the principles of, that they operate. And so what we've really focused on is this uh, principles of conduct governing an individual group. And the goal will be that, that regardless of where an IATA dealer resides, whether it be in Europe or Asia or Africa or you know, Middle East, it doesn't matter, that they will um, align themselves with the principles of conduct that we're talking about here with this group. And so um, you know, that's important for anyone who wants to become a member. And uh, we've had several, uh, specifically five uh, companies out of Europe and two out of Asia Pacific who have contacted us about becoming members now that they've heard this. And so um, I'm sure that there are more. I just haven't seen the reports yet. Um, but in terms of you know, the, the idea is that anybody who becomes a member is going to have to look at this code of ethics and, and make sure that they can operate in an environment where this can govern the transactions that they conduct. And there will be certain, um, certain companies out there that, that deselect themselves because they can't live up to this. And our goal is for the ones that do participate that each one will look at this 14-point code of ethics and, and adhere to it in the way that they operate. That's a very okay, kind of, that's a, that's a that's a really good question. So a follow on to that is what's going to be the system or process for ensuring that an IADA member doesn't violate the code of ethics and then what's going to be the result? How are you going to yeah. go through that? Yeah, so what we've created at the board level is a subcommittee that will handle all uh, ethics inquiries. Um, and we've, we've developed a process and procedure so that, you know, let's say that Mente Group, that I'm the president of, let's say that we, we're one of the companies that's been assessed, and I hope that's never the case. But let's just say so. I would have to recuse myself from that committee member, and there would be a, a, a team of people that would go through, that would research the, um, the complaint, uh, get evidence from the parties involved, and then if, if, if there is an issue that someone has failed it, then it depends on, you know, the way that the committee is going to be set up. They're going to be um, show cause to keep your accreditation, or it may be an outright termination of the accreditation from the, from the organization. And so, um, you know, it, it's, it's going to change the way that we, we govern ourselves as an organization. But, you know, with this, you know, we, we, we realize that um, we can't, you know, espouse this code of ethics and not live up to it. Uh, we have had cases recently where members um, have been brought up and we've done the research and assessed it and, you know, sometimes what's in the press is not exactly right and, you know, the facts have to speak for themselves and we'll keep each one of those conversations confidential, but um, it's, it's important for us to have a process and, and we've created that. What do you anticipate? Well, I guess you already know. What will the fees for a broker be, and what will the fees for an individual be? We're still working on that. Um, so as we look at this change, obviously the economics of the organization are going to change. Um, and what one of the things that's, that's, that's important to realize is that from an accreditation standpoint, we're going to have a third party that's going to do the accreditation for the organization. And um, depending on how often we require the accreditation to be established, you know, or to be reset, then that's going to drive the fee structure. So 
um, you know, we're looking at every three years or every five years, and the, and the fees are bouncing in that three thousand to five thousand dollar range. In order to be a member today, the membership fee, I believe, is eight thousand dollars annually. Um, that may go up. That's for the that's for the broker dealer members. And Tom, I'm sorry, I don't even know what the membership fee is for product and service members, but I'll find out and let you know. Okay, I'm sure my uh, our watchers or listeners uh, are going to be interested to hear that. I, I surely encourage all of you to Google IADA. Do they do they have a way of getting in touch with you now? Yeah, we, yeah, we do. So um, the new website is is coming online in on October first. Uh, but currently, if you go to NaraArrow.com, um, I'm sorry, NaraAircraft.Arrow, um, Nara N A R A Aircraft dot A E R O. You can go to our current website, and then there's a link in there for our IATA. And that, that new website is going to be up and running October 1st. Perfect. So if anyone wanted to speak to someone now, do you have a phone number they can call? Um, yeah, I do. Um, actually, just probably the best way right now is to get in touch with me. And our contact information is 214, or plus one, 214. 351-9595, and that, that call will come in. Our, my office is here, and then we'll get you in touch with the right people. Perfect. Well, uh, that seems to be the last of the questions. Thank you very much for this enlightening uh, webinar, and for those of you who are listening or watching, we are gonna, we've videoed this whole thing, we recorded the whole thing, and it's going to be available on our Arrow and Marine website as part of our uh, what's known as evergreen marketing program it'll be up there in perpetuity or until Brian tells me I have to take it down because he's grown hair and then uh, <laughs> yeah it's okay to laugh it's okay we need to have a little bit of humor in this situation but uh, it'll always be available it'll probably be up in less than 48 hours and Shay shaking your head and I'd like it to be within within 24, so we'll get it up as soon as we can. And Shay will uh, send out via email a link to that to everybody who signed on. In fact, everybody that didn't sign on but said they were going to, they'll get the link. So, Brian, again, thank you very, very much for uh, your good presentation. And uh, whenever you got something else you want to talk about, just let us know. Thanks, Tom. We appreciate it.